The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, author David Friedlander on the AOC generation and its political evolution. Author Amanda Frost on citizen stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers, plus Bill Press with former Northern Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock on why the GOP needs to distance itself from Trump. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. The Trump presidency continues to reshape the political landscape, and that includes a resurgent young left. That's the subject of a new book from David Friedlander, and at its center is the rise of Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And we say hello to Amanda Frost, who's the Bronfman Professor of Law and Government at American University, also the author most recently of You Are Not American, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott, to the dreamers. Amanda Frost, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, our pleasure to have you with us. Uh, It makes sense to start this conversation with a shared understanding of what citizenship means. What are the core concepts as you define citizenship and how is it that this can be such a subject for debate? Yeah, so citizenship, of course, has a legal meaning. It means you're a full member with all the rights and privileges of a community. And in the United States today, that means you have, most importantly, the right to enter and remain in the United States, as well as the right to vote and hold office. But it also has a non-legal meaning. I think it's many of us uh, relate to citizenship as a sense of our identity and belonging to a community. And that's a very important part of my book, as well as the legal meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who may not be familiar with the term, what is citizenship stripping? Yeah, so that's something that kind of shocked me, which is, of course, why I wrote the book. I think we all, or I certainly had the sense that once I was a U.S. citizen, I was born a U.S. citizen, that could not be taken away from me. And what I learned while I researched this book is that that's wrong. Millions of Americans have lost their citizenship over our country's history. And I start the book with Dred Scott, but it does not end there and it continues to this day. It doesn't always take the same form. Sometimes it's a legal decision. Sometimes it's the executive branch government's decision. Sometimes it's just a lack of paperwork that's impossible to get and find and prove your citizenship. But whichever way you cut it, at the end of the day, the person's not a citizen and lacks the right, the the legal rights of a citizen and the sense of belonging that comes with that. And I think it's probably safe to say that most people thought the same way that you did. I I certainly always have. Um, Never would I expect my citizenship to be taken away from me. And yet here we are talking about this book. Uh, You've said that the history of citizenship or citizenship stripping, is a little-known phenomenon that happens far more frequently than you even realized when you started to write your book. So what did you learn that surprised you? Yeah, so I think what, what what I first learned that shocked me was the story of Ethel McKenzie. Ethel McKenzie was a a suffragist. She'd been born in San Francisco, lived in the U.S. her whole life. She won the right to vote or helped to win the right to vote for California's women, and then she goes to cast her ballot, and she's told by the registrar in San Francisco— you can't vote. You're not even a citizen because you married a non-citizen. And under U.S. law in place at the time, a federal law, which was uh, started in 1907 but went on for decades, U.S. citizen women who married non-citizens automatically lost their citizenship. So that shocked me, and I told her story in the book. And then, of course, that uh, spurred my research into all the different ways in which the United States has engaged in citizenship stripping over its history. Yeah, and we've got some others to talk about. Um your book focuses on the stories of people, of course, who lost citizenship. And it starts with the case of Dred Scott. Why is this case essential to our understanding of citizenship stripping in America? So Dred Scott really is, it it points to the the founding 
um, the founding hypocrisy of our nation and the problem that we have not overcome yet today, which is our history of slavery. Um, and of course, the aftermath of the Civil War, where I don't think we reconciled ourselves to fully integrating the newly freed slaves and other racial and ethnic minorities uh, into the United States as full-fledged citizens. So I think many Americans know the Dred Scott decision, the infamous decision holding that Dred Scott, a slave, remained a slave. He'd sued for his freedom. Less well known is the fact that the course, court also declared in that decision that no black person, slave or free, could be considered a citizen of the United States. And that was shocking at the time because there were half a million free blacks who lived in Northern states and who voted and who participated as citizens in the society, not always as equals, but with some of those rights. So that was a shocking aspect of the decision as well. After the civil war, Congress enacted the 14th amendment, which created birthright citizenship for every person born on US soil. And so you might think, well, great, the story should end there, um, but it doesn't. And that's what my book explains a long battle for citizenship ensued despite that clear language of the Constitution. You also tell the story of Wong Kim Ark, son of a Ch of Chinese immigrants born in the United States in the late 1800s. And yet he was denied re-entry to the U.S. after visiting family in China on the grounds that he wasn't an actual citizen. And yet he was born in the United States. Why is that such an important story to tell? Yes, and I think that, you know, I think Dred Scott is fairly familiar to people, but Wong Kim Ark's decision is not, and it really should be, because he was one of the key actors in creating birthright citizenship for all Americans, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or their parents' immigration status, even though occasionally people like President Trump still call that into question today. That was clearly established by Wong Kim Ark, as well as the 14th Amendment. So as you say, Wong Kim Ark, born in the United States, a birthright citizenship under the 14th Amendment, in the US his whole life, but he goes to visit family when he's about 25. When he comes back to the United States by steamship, his own government says, we concede you were born in the United States, but we deny that you're a US citizen. And they go up to the Supreme Court and happily that battle ended in Wong Kim Ark's favor. But I was really interested to discover that was not the end of the fight, even for Wong Kim Ark. A couple of years later, he was stopped and detained, arrested, by immigration officials who didn't believe he was a citizen. He had to convince them. He was, he was the man who won that right for all in the Supreme Court case. And as I explained in the book, the battle goes on for Wong Kim Ark and for others. I, it's, as you tell that story, and, and keep in mind, we're talking about the late 1800s, um, that's still going on. It, you know, it, it, it's just, it's awful. Uh, we're speaking to Amanda Frost, Bronfman Professor of Law and Government at American University, author most recently of You Are Not American, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Uh, Amanda, we now have to skip over many, many important stories to talk about today. Um, and because sadly, citizen stripping is still used as a tool of discrimination. You mentioned President Trump. How did that advance under the Trump administration? Yeah, so the, the last chapter of my book is citizenship stripping today, and it grew longer and longer as I was researching and writing the book over the last three years, um, because the Trump administration did a lot in that regard. Now, it looks a little different than in the past. In the past, citizenship stripping was often a formal act of government saying, you're no longer an American. Today, it's more likely to be that the government makes it difficult to impossible to prove citizenship. So one example is people born near the southern border of the United States um, who are born outside of hospitals, which is quite common in that area, which is quite rural. They have great difficulty proving their citizenship. The government won't trust their birth certificates. So that's one example. Another example very much related to the Trump administration specifically is that under President Trump, the nation embarked on a massive denaturalization campaign to take away citizenship from those who are naturalized citizens. Now, in the past, president, other presidents denaturalized people, true, but 10 or 11 per year, and that's under previous Republican and Democratic administrations for the last 50 years. But Trump took office. He very clearly and explicitly said, we're going to go after naturalized citizens. If we find a flaw in their process, we're going to denaturalize them. And they started investigating 700,000 naturalized citizens. So that's another recent example of the Trump administration's activities. And finally, he questioned whether the children of undocumented immigrants should be birthright citizens. And he claimed he could reverse it with an executive order, which in my view as a lawyer, that is, is a, a false claim. But the point is he was raising that argument from Wong Kim Ark yet again today. 
in you know the year 20, 2020 saying uh, the children of undocumented immigrants born in the U.S. are not birthright citizens. So he was making that citizenship strip a claim, a claim yet again today. The man still makes me shake my head. Um, are there some important ways in which these issues uh, break down along party lines? Um, yes and no. I mean, there's no question, but that President Trump took this to a, a new level. But some of the examples I have of citizenship stripping occurred under Democratic presidents and uh, under justices of the Supreme Court appointed by Democrats. So I don't think one party um, has a lock on this. I will say that today it is very clear that citizenship stripping is tied closely with xenophobia, uh, with anti-immigration views, and with racism. And I think, frankly, that's a problem the Republican Party has um, that I won't say Democrats are free from that. We all as a nation need to struggle with that. But I will say that I think the Republicans are the the party that is more likely to engage in citizenship stripping today, as Trump administration showed us. Mm-hmm. But also reversed very quickly many of the Trump administration policies that were hostile to immigrants and to naturalized citizens. Are you seeing indications from the Biden administration about more of this being reversed? Yes. So a a couple of examples. I I don't know where Biden stands on the denaturalization campaign, although my strong suspicion is that he will defund that or or certainly take away um, resources from that effort. It is not a goal of his to denaturalize U.S. citizens. Thank goodness. Um, In addition, he has made it clear that he's going to roll back some of the barriers or obstacles to naturalizing, to becoming a citizen that the Trump administration had put into place. Um, And he's also made it clear that he's not going to target indiscriminately all immigrants for removal from the United States who are suspected to be undocumented. And that's important, too, because under a blanket effort to remove everyone, you inevitably start removing by accident American citizens. And in fact, there's a scholar who studied this who said 1% of the people at any time in detention, immigration detention, are actually U.S. citizens who are there by mistake. They can't prove their citizenship. Wow. That's, um, that's startling. Um, well, I should say 1% of- means, means 3000 people a year. So yeah. it's not a, a, a it's, it's an important number. Yeah, very much so. Um, it, and so much of this book is startling and, um, Anyway, just kind of just kind of makes you shake your head and, and wonder where we are right now in our society. Um, if the Biden administration were to really take on this issue of citizenship in a way that expressed the most egalitarian values of our nation, what should they do? Um, so first, and, and this is something Biden is doing, I think naturalization should be more easily available. It should be less expensive. It should be less time consuming. We should welcome and embrace those immigrants who want to become citizens and full members of our community. Um, It goes without saying, I think, but to be clear, clear, you can only become a citizen if you're legally present as an immigrant. So these are people that are legally present. And the question is whether we're going to welcome welcome them into the full rights and privileges of citizenship. So that's one one, um, aspect of the uh, one one response that Biden is already engaged in. Uh, A second way in which Biden could embrace um, the current residents of the United States as citizens would be to grant a pathway to citizenship to undocumented immigrants. Now, that's beyond the scope of my book, but I'm mentioning that because it's certainly of current interest today. It is part of the Biden administration's opening effort to um, uh, provide a legal pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants. And he started on that task, and I support that effort. Amanda Frost, Bronfman Professor of Law and Government at American University, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Also, the author most recently of You Are Not American, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Amanda, we appreciate your time with us. Um, It has been a very eye-opening discussion today, and it's an eye-opening book, and I encourage everybody to check it out. Thank you for your time with us. We'd love to have you back again soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. 
Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, the startling history of citizenship stripping in America and its persistence today. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. Woody Guthrie had a lot to say about the greed of bankers who made crop loans at usurious interest rates to hardscrabble farmers, then foreclosed on them when they couldn't pay off the loans, leaving thousands of farm families homeless. Woody mocked them with a sarcastic anthem, singing, I'm a jolly banker, jolly banker am I. He also penned a stinging verse about their thievery. Some will rob you with a six-gun, some with a fountain pen. But even this populist poet of the people would be astonished by the shameless grabbiness of today's farm lenders. After decades of systemic, scandalous discrimination by bankers against black and other minority farmers, the Biden administration is now moving to pay off the onerous level of long-term bank debt that has shackled these good farmers, thus giving them a fair shot at getting ahead. Oh, no, squawked the American Bankers Association and other groups of ag lenders. Why? After all, they'd be getting back the money they had loaned out. Yes, say the fountain pens, but we would lose the interest payments each of those farmers would have had to send to us over the months ahead. We want American taxpayers to cover the total interest income we would have gotten from gouging black, Latino, native, and other minority farmers. They insist that their profits and the financial interests of their rich investors must take priority over the needs of a bunch of non-white dirt farmers. Wait, the banker's greed intensifies. If the government doesn't fully compensate them for their so-called loss interest income, the ag lenders, backed by Wall Street barons, are openly threatening that they will cut off future loans to farmers and ranchers of color. This is Jim Hightower saying, so the jolly banker's drumbeat of rank discrimination keeps pounding. To help stop it, connect with the National Black Farmers Association, blackfarmers.org. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by the Lowdown Happy Hour, now live streaming on Facebook from the Chat and Chew Cafe. So grab a libation, pull up a virtual chair, and join our freewheeling conversations with political mavericks, musical agitators, and kick-ass grassroots groups. The Lowdown Happy Hour will connect you to good trouble activists who are building people power across America. Get the Lowdown at HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. In her newest book, author Amanda Frost takes us into the little-known story of when and why our government has made the choice to revoke citizenship. It's a practice that expresses the history of racism and xenophobia in America and remains all too present today. And we say hello to David Friedlander, contributor to Politico magazine and New York magazine and writes for a variety of publications about politics, the arts and New York City. He's also an adjunct professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where he teaches politics and political theory. His new book is titled The AOC Generation, How Millennials Are Seizing Power and Rewriting the Rules of American Politics. David Friedlander, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Great to be here. 
Yeah, nice to have you with us. And uh, this is really an interesting topic uh, for a lot of reasons. But why was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, such a compelling figure for you to write about, given her still very short career in Congress? Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly like aware of the fact that, you know, she is a new figure on, on the scene um, and so lacks a kind of clout and power that we traditionally think of, you know, important lawmakers from having uh, down in Washington. Um, but, you know, when she won uh, her election in, in June of, of 2018, I mean, it was as if it was like really nothing I've ever seen in politics. Um, I mean, the closest comparisons would be sort of Donald Trump in 2015 or Barack Obama in sort of 2007, 2008, where, I mean, just the world exploded to find out who this person was, um, you know, what she represented, what her story was. I mean, I had people calling from overseas to find out who she was. Uh, she just became this phenomenon almost overnight uh, that I think we hadn't quite witnessed before. And so I wanted to sort of figure out how and why that happened. Well, and I should point out the book is is not as much a biography, but a telling of a political moment. And, and, and part of that is about a political awakening of millennial activists. Tell us about who some of these activists are. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I think there was maybe like a part of me that did want to do a biography, um, but she just didn't have kind of enough life. I mean, she's so, so young. She's less young now. But but at the time, I mean, I think she was 28. You know, there's just not an, a, a lot going on there. So you want to, I think as a sort of writer, biographer, journalist, historian, you want to figure out what the sort of forces are that make something like this possible. Um, and th that she was a sort of beneficiary of, right? And so, you know, in her case, I think the sort of er tech, so to speak, is the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, that really sort of changed the trajectory, I think, of, uh, American politics and certainly American democratic and liberal politics. You had this explosion of interest in organizing and political organizing and local organizing right after that election, um, where you had groups like Democratic Socialists of America, which had been, um, you know, chugging along for decades as this kind of fringe outfit, suddenly had you know, his membership doubled or something like that overnight almost, and then doubled again the next day. Um, you had groups like Indivisible that, that, that showed up and said that they were going to sort of start this Tea Party of the Left kind of, you know, organizing system. Uh, the Women's March happened. Um, there was like an explosion of media and, and new media and social media. Um, and that all that, I think, kind of contributed to this moment that, 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 Ocasio-Cortez kind of, you know, rode the wave of. Yeah. What's your understanding that this kind of activism is happening and, and why now? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think some of it really is generational way. You have a, a group of folks coming into the electorate who, you know, a rising generation, which is more diverse than previous generations, uh, better educated than previous generations, uh, and that sort of grounds its politics in these sort of moral concerns that I think the rest of us, as we kind of move through our lives, tend to tend to forget. Um, you know, it's also a generation that has, you know, lived through, a, a, in some respects, a time of sort of remarkable peace and prosperity in the country, but also sort of seen the the, the, the sort of American promise drift away as college gets more expensive, the locked out of housing markets, jobs don't pay quite as well. Um, and I think you have to, you really have to consider that as a factor. Mm -hmm. You know, something that gets me too is you know, the fact that she was 28 when, when she was elected. And yeah. um, I wonder how much of that is it like an all, almost one of those things where, wow, it's one of us. It's mm -hmm. somebody who, you know, I never thought I would be able to be that close, at least in age, to somebody at that level. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that's certainly part of it. I mean, I think you have to, you sort of also have to tease out her own sort of preternatural political skills. Like she was, she grew up in a social media age. Uh, she was, all, she was so sort of fluent in that language, and then sort of also fluent in this new pop cultural language that I think a lot of politicians aren't capable of speaking. You know, she could appear on um, whatever your sort of morning, you know, hip hop 
drive program on the radio and it didn't seem awkward. It seemed like she was a sort of natural fit in that. Um, and then, you know, but I also think you have to, that some of it was that she was, people were so kind of afraid of her, I think, uh, especially her political opponents uh, on the right. I mean, we'd all been hearing for years about how there was this new generation coming. They were super diverse. They were like female led. They were very, very liberal. And then it arrived in one night in June in 2018, here it was. Uh, and it was not backing down. It was, it was ferocious and was expressing its values uh, in a way that was, I think, unusually frank. So we see this movement of young activists attach themselves to AOC. Just how important was that to her electoral victory? Well, I mean, yeah, they attach themselves to her and she sort of attaches themselves herself to them, I think, is sort of what happened. Um, and, you know, she was the beneficiary of just a lot of organizing that had happened, you know, when she was kind of just sort of figuring out what to do with her life. Um, yeah, I don't know how many of your listeners know this, but, you know, of course, she was a bartender. That story has sort of been, been well told. Um, but she was only like a bartender really kind of briefly. She was more of like a young person kind of trying, I think, to figure out what to do with her life. She had a couple sort of dot-com, uh, you know, tech entrepreneurial type of jobs. She wanted to be in nonprofits. You know, she was looking for work in various places and none of that, you know, quite quite worked out for her. Um, and then there was all this sort of explosion of interest in, in politics. Here, here in New York, for example, for years there'd been this group of democratic state lawmakers that had caucus with the Republicans and kept the Republicans in control of the state legislature. I I've covered Albany politics for a long time. It was just a sort of fact of life. You know, you tell people at parties about it, no one really much cared. After November 2016, everyone really cared about that. And so they started getting together in living rooms and coffee shops. And what can we do about this? Our, our, my local Democratic state lawmaker turns out to be caucusing with the Republicans. And so they started getting together around that. And then all that kind of organizing, all that kind of energy, um, I think, really helped, you know, um, uh, sort of make her into the sort of, you know, superstar that she was. Yeah. We're speaking to David Friedlander, uh, adjunct professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where he teaches politics and political theory. And his new book is titled The AOC Generation, How Millennials Are Seizing Power and Rewriting the Rules of American Politics. And David, the, the, the book also tells the stories of individual people who, as you express it, powered her rise. Why were these stories important to tell? And, and perhaps you could share one of them. Well, I mean, because I think that, you know, she's the one who kind of, we all know, um, but all the people, there's all these other people that helped really create uh, this moment. And I think that, you know, they're kind of heroes in their own way too, or, or they're at least a sort of protagonist um, of, of this story. Um, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a bunch that, that sort of make up the book. I mean, I talk about like the Young Turks, for example, which is, um, I don't know how many of your, of your listeners know it, but it's a it's a sort of online only uh, cable, I guess you call it, sort of left news program um, that is is huge in its little niche um, and really uh, you know caters to, to sort of young progressives and, and um, you know it's it sort of covered Ocasio's campaign when no one else would. Um, similarly, there's an online outlet called The Intercept, um, uh, which is uh, you know, really sees itself as a kind of political player in advancing the cause of Ocasio-Cortezism or, or, or whatever, or whatever you, know, you sort of want to call it. There's magazines like Jacobin, which is a sort of thoughtful, uh, you know, left critique of American politics. Is there a lesson that Democrats should be learning about the success of AOC and the movement that supports her? Well, I mean, I think that it's tough because I, I you know, I, it, it, the way of the sort of distorting effect of our political system, right, is that, that you know, the district where Ocasio-Cortez uh, can, can win office and then, you know, sort of achieve whatever she achieves. I mean, obviously, it's so different to actually for the party to hold power. Um, but, but, but that said, I mean, I think that what she does is talks to voters in a way that most Democratic politicians have not figured out how to do. Um, 
she's authentic, she's dynamic, she sort of speaks to them on the level. Um, and, and she, you know, invites them into her home, quite literally, she has these Instagram live shows where she talks shows them her dog and cooks dinner and talks about legislation that's, that's running through Congress. And so I think beyond any kind of ideology, which, which can get complicated if you want to achieve political power. I think that there's something about just sort of finding these folks who are outside of the political system, but have these skills that haven't sort of been thought of as political skills necessarily all the time. Yeah, she is. She has this amazing appeal um, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I mean, she's obviously extremely intelligent. But at the same time, as you say, she talks right to you, right on your level. It's 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 unlike any other politician that I can think of. Yeah, I mean, like if you could sort of bottle that thing that's called political charisma, you you would and you would sell it, and everyone would have it. But but you can't. But she really has it. Um, and I don't know what that is and how she developed it. I mean, I don't think any of us do. But she is just she's so good at that. I mean, when you interview her, which I've done a couple of times, you know, I've interviewed lots of politicians in my day. I mean, you're almost left almost kind of speechless in a way because she kind of just can like tie a bow around the thought that she's having so neatly that there's really nothing else to say to it. Um, You know, and she's sort of constantly kind of proving herself in, in this way and able to kind of command the political world's attention uh, in a way that most politicians don't. And it's especially remarkable considering, you know, as you said at the top, I mean, she is just a sort of second term lawmaker. She has no real power down in Washington, DC. All her power is this kind of media power and that's what she commands to her benefit. Mm -hmm. Now being a member in Congress often offers tough lessons in pragmatism, as you well know, Uh, That's something Biden is surely dealing with as he faces a divided Congress and the ever present threat of filibuster. Can you imagine AOC bending to this kind of pressure in any way? And and secondarily, how would her supporters respond if she did? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that AOC sort of needs to figure out for her own sake is she always seems to be sort of on the side of the activist class and doesn't quite, you know, if the activists are calling for something, she sort of feels like she needs to be the one carrying their voices to Congress. Um, and that's what my book is about in a way. I mean, she sort of explicitly ran on that, but those folks aren't in the room sort of for a reason, I think it's fair to say. Um, and there's a difference between being an activist and a lawmaker. And I have not seen her quite willing to sort of disappoint that flank, um, so to speak. That, that, that said, I mean, I think she's a little quieter these days, actually, than she was in her first term. I mean, you occasionally see her say something about, you know, oh, she was sort of disappointed uh, that the stimulus bill wasn't big enough or something along those lines. Um, but for the most part, it seems like she's kind of being a little bit more of a team player, at least in the early days of the Biden administration. You know, I, I, I don't know how long that will last, but that's sort of my read on it at the moment. Is it is it a maturation of of, of terms in Congress? The, the, the more you're in there, the, the you're kind of you're, you're learning the rules, the way to play the game sort of thing. It might be that. I mean, I think it's also, you know, we did all just have the sort of shock of the Trump years and then the shock of January 6th. I think Democrats are pretty unified as they are uh, aware of the threat that a sort of Trumpified Republican Party holds for the Republic. Um, and I think also there's a sense perhaps, and if this is right, it's, it's, it would be accurate and clever, you know, with these very slender House majorities uh, that are gonna be tough to hold on to in, in 2022, it, there is a sort of responsibility that comes with governing that's different when you are, when Democrats held just one House of Congress as they did her first term, Republicans control the Senate and the presidency. Um, and so like with that comes like more responsibility. Very good point. David Freelander, contributor to Politico and New York magazines, writes for a variety of publications about politics, the arts in New York City. And uh, his new book is titled The AOC Generation, How Millennials Are Seizing Power and Rewriting the Rules of American Politics. Great stuff. David, we appreciate your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again soon. Anytime. We appreciate it. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats.
We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press with former Northern Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock on why the GOP is better off without Trump. It is a challenge to win the popular vote, but Donald Trump is taking 46.9 and starting a civil war among a minority of people. And so even if he wins that 46.9, hey, 80% of them are with me or 70% are with me. That's a double digit loss in a general election. Mm -hmm. There's no math you can do. And that's it's like, riddle me the math, you know, Batman. You know, (laughs) um, How do you take 46.9 and divide it by any factor and end up with 50%? You just don't. And there's not any... um, even electoral or with redistricting that gets you to get a presidential win. Now, how things go in redistrict, you know, in redistricting and how people might win seats in particular areas, again, because we're a 50-50 country and we're, we're sort of more now red and blue, I think we're going to have more purple districts after redistricting, so that'll be interesting. But long-term, Trumpism is sore loserism. It's it's grievance politics and it's a grievances of a person of one man who's, you know, now just propagating insane theories that, you know, the election's gonna be overturned in Arizona, then we're off to the next state, and somehow thinking this is all going to, you know, I mean, he's kind of where the my pillow guy is from what I said <laughs> of his recent um, analysis and that, I mean, it's, it's just sad and we need to move past it. Uh, before we take a break here, I do have to ask you, what is your take on the role that, uh, house Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy has played in all of this? Are you disappointed that he hasn't stood up more on his own, uh, and that he took this action against Liz Cheney? Well, like I said, I think it's it's different. You know, the House and the Senate have approached it differently. You saw the speech that Mitch McConnell made. And, right. and certainly, you know, I mean, myself, I would have been with the guys who voted for impeachment on, you know, House and Senate and and their statements. So but I did, you know, I understand why a lot of Republicans didn't want to vote for impeachment. And that was why you had people like, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell, Leader McConnell saying what he said. So, yes, it's I think it's. Again, I think it's disappointing and, and misguided because I think it would have been better for the party to and the House to at least have had a variety of views on January 6th so that so the people who did oppose, you know, everything that happened there felt like they were still being represented in leadership, but it also wasn't disqualifying. Um, for being a Republican. But the good news is it's not disqualifying in the states. It's not disqualifying for state legislators or for members of Congress. So I encourage people, you know, and candidates and continue to work with them to get out there and and fight back. Because, listen, I mean, you know, if Brad Parscale or Corey Lewandowski or the guys you're running against, these are guys who twice lost, got their guy, you know, all their advice and everything Trump got impeached twice. He lost the House, he lost the Senate, and he lost the White House. I would not be afraid of that machine. And I would trust our principles and ideas and people of character running to prevail against that, which is why I am working with people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz and to, uh, you know, and make sure these people get those 10 people who voted for impeachment get reelected, but also, you know, many others who you know, we're not standing up to this big lie. Fred Upton was out yesterday, you know, denouncing the colleagues who were saying, oh, this is just like tourists that were there. I mean, he came down very hard on that. And Fred's in in a swing district in Michigan. He's one of the 
best legislators, who's worked on a bipartisan basis, who's done great things on health care. I mean, if you have cancer, there's no better advocate you've had than Fred Upton for you. And these are the people who are getting things done and who, to me, are inspiring. So that's who I'm going to focus on. You know, if you want more Fred Uptons and more Adam Kinzinger's and more uh, Ben Sasses and more Liz Cheney's and Kristen Nunu's, then you have to support them. And that's what I want. Bill Press with former Northern Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. If you'd like to hear the entire episode, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. David Friedlander, Amanda Frost, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.